thanks, Chris. And thanks everyone for being here um, or wherever you are. So um, whenever you have questions, feel free to um, speak up and interrupt me. I'm, you know, I'm always happy to hear and address questions. And I might not see them if they're posted in the chat because I'm screen sharing. Um, but without further ado, I guess I'll get started. So what I'm going to tell you about today is an application of uh, algebraic topology and specifically topological field theory to a question in condensed matter physics. So you could think of this as start with some physics question which physicists are interested in and then try and extract a mathematical problem out of it that is still that is interesting to both mathematicians and physicists and then solve the math question. So whenever you do that, there's the question of how do you model something which is not mathematical in a mathematical way. And so it turns out when it comes to topological phases, that's a very difficult problem and there's an awful lot that we don't know. And so I'll tell you, well, I'll tell you some of what we don't know and also some of what we do know. And um, so how we can extract some questions and then you know, some, some stuff that I've done on one particular one. So first, what is a topological phase of matter? So um, probably a lot of you were around for my five minute talk where I only sort of answered that question. I'm only gonna, I'm gonna give the same only sort of answer here. So um, sorry for the redundancy, but what happened was first, physicists working with materials discovered that there are these certain materials that did not fit into the pre-existing well understood classification of phases of matter due to Landau and Lifshitz. So um, you might take some particular alloy and then cool it to a certain temperature and then do something else, maybe apply a magnetic field. And then you get this very weird behavior. And so um, one, one hallmark is that you might get, uh, you might get uh, things which behave like particles but are not literally particles. So what happens um, what is actually happening in, in the physics is you have a bunch of electrons that are entangled in some unusual way that you get an excitation that, you know, is local. So it, it might as well be a particle from the perspective of just trying to think about it. But its statistics are weird. It's not a boson and it's not a fermion. So that's kind of, that's weird when you, or that's nonsensical if it were literally a particle. But you get these, these patterns of, of excitations which behave in this interesting, unusual way. So this this was what led to um, the idea of topological phases of matter, is that they're phases of matter which have, you know, th in these and other ways, their behavior depends more on things like the topology of the system than, than just the geometry. So great, that's the experimental side. And so then pe people who work on the theory of condensed matter phys physics said, great, let's classify them. And so that is, that is a, that has attracted a lot of research in the past at least 10 years, probably a little further back. And so that's where, that's where the mathematical problem begins. So first, how do we actually model these theoretically? And so the, the standard way to do this in condensed matter physics is what might be called a lattice system or a lattice Hamiltonian. So what, what we're going to do is, we ha is let's say we're, we're putting this material on some manifold. So the, you turn everything into, you, you want to express a state space in a Hamiltonian in a purely combinatorial way. So first, you triangulate your manifold, or maybe you take a CW structure. It's you know, something combinatorial, but the example that we'll deal with today is triangulations. Then you want to write down a Hilbert space and a Hamiltonian built purely out of the combinatorial data. So the um, Hamiltonian is a self-adjoint operator on this complex Hilbert space, and both of these should be local. And what that, so let me say precisely what that means. So in this, um, we have a bunch of sites on the on, uh, coming from the triangulation. That is, you could you can consider a particular vertex or a particular edge. And the Hilbert space is a tensor product of what's called local Hilbert spaces, meaning that you specify, okay, at every vertex I want maybe C2 or C3 or something. At every edge, maybe I want this. And then the total Hilbert space is the tensor product of all of these Hilbert spaces associated with, well, local information on, on the triangulation. For the, the Hamiltonian being local means that once we have, now that we have this local description of the Hilbert space, you can say, okay, I want, I, I can build operators on this Hilbert space, which are, you know, a tensor product of things which are trivial outside of some patch. And maybe patch means specified with the graph distance because this is combinatorial and that's okay. And so the Hamiltonian should be built out of local operators. Um, if you're looking for an example, there will be one soon. 
So that's, that's the idea of how to model these. And so this suggests, oh, sorry, before that, let me say what this is supposed to mean. So these are quantum mechanical systems. So the Hilbert space is the space of states that the system can be in. And um, the, uh, eig so eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian are energy levels and eigenvectors are states with that amount of energy. So it should say eigenvector of the Hamiltonian. Sorry about that. So uh, we would like to, we'd like to specify that there is a lowest energy state or sorry, there's, there's a smallest eigenvalue, which in practice, if you're doing this on a compact manifold, these things are finite, and so that's not so hard. Um, sorry, the Hilbert space is finite dimensional. But so, so if we have a smallest eigenvalue, then its eigenspace is called the space of ground states. And so physically, this is thought of as, as the vacuum states, so there are no particles. And then the next, the next energy state, or sorry, the next eigenvalue corresponds to uh, particles of like minimal energy excitation. So you might think of a particle with a part particular location. And as I mentioned, Ar Arun, maybe yes. just I could ask a quick, quick question. Course. So are you already, are you imagining that we've really fixed the lattice or are you already imagining that we have some like system of uh, lattices that we're refining? And so are you mm -hmm. talking, I mean, you just said H was going to be finite, but actually mm -hmm. I'd already started imagining some system of lattices that would lead to H being infinite? Ah, great question. So as I'm talking about it here, you just pick a lattice and work with it. But if you're actually thinking about doing physics with this, then you then somehow, so one perspective on this is that the lattice is fundamental. Like you, you're studying a crystal and the lattice is the crystalline structure. Mm -hmm. But another perspective is that you're trying to approximate some continuum system and you'd like the lattice to get finer and finer and finer. I think that's, that's what Chris is getting at. So what I'm gonna do in this talk is just pick a lattice and then do things that happen to work for, for arbitrary lattices. But in general, the perspective of we would like, we'd like to imagine some sort of renormalization where the lattice gets finer is a really good perspective to have on this. And ultimately, some of the things that I say that we don't know how to make mathematical yet, that's, gonna, that's probably going to be related in that the solution to figuring out how to say some of these things precisely will involve a family of lattices getting finer and finer. Yeah, great question. Um, did that address the question? Are there more follow-up questions? That was exactly what I was wondering, thanks. Cool, yeah, thank you for asking. All right, so I, where was I? Right, okay, so we have ground states, and then the next, the next smallest eigenvalue you can think of as these, these uh, particle-like excitations. So in particular, next lowest energy state means that I'd like the, we'd like the Hamiltonian to be gapped. So this actually is relevant to Chris's question because we have, you know, if you just pick some lattice on a or some triangulation on a compact manifold, then these things generally are going to be finite dimensional. And in the examples I talk about today, they are finite dimensional. Um, so gapped Hamiltonian is kind of a dumb requirement to, to impose. Right, so could I have a question, yes, please? What's up? This is Ezra Getzler. Uh, yes. what, what is a gapped Hamiltonian? So I, I didn't that see just the means, picture. oh, that means spectral gaps. So there is. But there's a um, mass gap. You just mean the yes. Hamiltonian has a mass gap. It, the yes, precisely. Is not, is not um, yeah, okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay. So, so if, the, if, if, H is, if the Hilbert space is finite dimensional, this is, this is pretty trivial. But if you're imagining doing some sort of uh, refining the lattice to produce a possibly infinite dimensional system, then this gets interesting. And defining that precisely is good, I think will require a little more thought in, in the, this particular setting. Um, let's see. Right. So there is not a one to one correspondence between lattice Hamiltonian systems and topological phases, we think. So uh, it's not clear what a mathematical definition of a topological phase is. It's, we expect that they are modeled by these Hamiltonian systems and that there's that there's a certain equivalence relation, which is that you can deform one Hamiltonian into another without closing the gap. And again, to make that precise, you'd want to say something about families of, la of, of lattices under refinement. But, um, and that's part, of, that's part of what we don't know how to make precise yet. I, and, um, but it should be, it sh you know, small uh, gap preserving deformations of the Hamiltonian shouldn't change the physics that you observe qualitatively. What are the types of particles? How do they interact, et cetera? 
And so if you want to define, if you want to say, well, what are the possible kinds of physics that can occur, you'd like to say those are equivalent. So, um, but again, making that, mathematic, uh, making that mathematically precise runs into some difficulties, which, ah, yes, is what I was going to say in this slide. So, okay, well, we have, we have some things that we can do mathematically. We have Hilbert spaces and Hamiltonians. So we take the space of all of them and then maybe say, I, ideally, let's remove the gapless ones and let's take pi zero of that space. And then voila, there's the answer. But this is nowhere near a, a real idea yet. And so part of that is what I've been talking about before, that there's some, you know, these, these issues with approximating a, an actual quantum system using these finite approximations. And it's the same as always, you know, in this field. You, you want to do some mathematics related to quantum field theory, and you quickly run into the problem that making quantum field theory mathematical is very difficult. But there will also, it turns out, there's also a couple new surprises coming from condensed matter physics. And so I know um, there's been some talk about fractons, you know, here at MSRI. And so that's, that's one of the surprises. So whatever definition eventually will, uh, will make this dream a reality, it's going to have to acknowledge that, that fracton phases exist and somehow work around them. Um, oh, okay. Uh, before I go on, any, any more questions? Okay, so, you know, you might have noticed that I've, I've, I've couched a lot of what I just said in terms of we don't know how to do this, or they should be this, or the physics says this, but we don't know how to do it mathematically. So in order to actually do math, we got to find another way to, to get at these things. So, sorry, Rune, maybe yes. I do have okay. another question oh, yeah, on your course. previous slide. Um, I mean, you, you mentioned fractons, which makes yeah. me, not that I really understand those, but... Me too. Um, but I have the feeling that in some sense, they're not topological in the sense, in the most naive sense or in the sense in which other, some other things are topological. And so that makes mm -hmm. me wonder whether you are trying to restrict attention to things that will be in some sense topological or not. Ah, yeah, this is also a great question. Um, so what I, what I meant by was, if you, if you write down a, Hamil a Hamiltonian, in say dimension three plus one, how do you know whether it's you know actually something that behaves a lot like a topological phase? So, sorry, let me say that sentence again. So, if someone hands you a Hamiltonian, and you'd like to say this is a topological phase. You know, it has salient properties of a topological phase, or this is a fracton phase which behaves weirdly. And we don't have a general, as far as I know, there's no general test for that yet, where you can, you know, you, you can study the behavior and try and compute some some ground state degeneracies. But until we have a way of saying, okay, these, these things are topological phases and these things are fracton phases, which are not, then we don't know how to throw out those fracton phases mm -hmm. to get a well-defined theory of topological phases. Got it. Okay. Fair enough. And I've talked to a couple of people at, um, I remember, I think I was talking to Fiona who said, well, for her, fracton phases are the, are the interesting thing. And maybe for me, it's something to be worked around, but it's that's not a point of view shared by everyone. And there's lots of interesting mathematical physics to be found there. Yep. Cool. Um, more, more questions or thoughts? All right. So we're going to try and get at these things another way. And so the idea of, is the, the idea of this, of this ansatz, is that topological phases at low energy should be described by topological field theories. And so that's a physics sentence that even making precise at the physics level is, is a bit difficult. But, we, but the idea is that topological field theories, we know how to make mathematical. You know, there, there's a Bordism category and there, there's a functor to something else, like maybe uh, vector spaces. And so the, the idea might be, given a lattice Hamiltonian system, find a way to extract a topological field theory out of it and then study that, that TFT. So this also, um, well, this also is not yet a, um, a mathematical theorem or even a precise conjecture, but I will be able to say precise, some things precisely that we are able to get out of it. So, but while, while, while I'm dreaming, it'd be, the, the hope is that this induces an equivalence between topological phases and TFT is under some equivalence relation, which is related to the fact that you could deform top, uh, lattice Hamiltonians. So I'll call this the low energy limit of the system. You might also hear low energy effective theory or uh, something like that. 
And so when I say it's called the low energy limit, you know, this is a little bit uh, bold in that we don't, like I said, it's not a, it's not a theorem yet. It's not, um, it's not, like we don't, we don't quite know how to do this. We know pieces of it. And so saying the low energy limit is still a little bit um, forward, but we, we are able to say something. So the first thing that should be true about this is that given a topological phase on some co-dimension one manifold, so we think of this as space dimension rather than space time. So we can extract the space of ground states and that's some vector space or Hilbert space. And given a topological field theory, we can say, well, what's just the state space of that? We don't have, you know, we don't have anything other than that. We just have a vector space. And if for the, so the, uh, the space of states, what that, what the functor assigns to that manifold should be the same as the space of ground states on this lattice model. And that's a, um, so that's the first thing that we um, should be able to say about the low energy limit is it captures the space of ground states in that sense. And we can in general say a little more, but not much more. And so this is, you know, because of difficulties of, of defining a topological phase or of studying the space of all Hamiltonians, there's, there's no theorems yet that say, okay, well, in general, we can always do this, but we can study examples. And there's, there's, an, a, there's an abundance of examples, which um, in various dimensions and, you know, various theorems relating certain lattice systems to topological field theories. So I promised an example, so let's do it. So the, the example that everyone always talks about is the toric code. So this is, this is the Drosophila melanogaster of, of topological phases, I guess. So what, what we're gonna do is we're going to build a gauge theory-like system. Well, it is a gauge theory, I guess, in a, but in, uh, in a physics sense. But the gauge group is the integers mod two, and we're doing it on a lattice. So let's, let's fix a closed D manifold with a triangulation. So we, we're gonna start with a groupoid of fields and it's a discrete groupoid, but that's, that's okay. So you might, you might think of this as a stack of fields if you like thinking that way. We're gonna take principal Z2 bundles on the one skeleton of M, and, um, but we're gonna equip them with a trivialization on the zero skeleton. So if you've heard about, if you've thought about the Torah code in terms of spins, then there's a way to translate from that perspective to this one. And I'm not gonna go into detail right now, but it's not super complicated. And if you wanna hear more about it, um, let me know and I'd be happy to chat about it afterwards. But the point is that you can translate the standard description of the Torah code into this more gauge theoretical. So we have, um, so we have some, some groupoid and then we take the space of functions on it. So that just means that take, uh, take pi zero of this groupoid, so take isomorphism classes of such principal bundles, and just take the, the uh, free vector space on that. So since M is closed, this is a finite dimensional Hilbert space. So a state is, is a function on the fields, and we're gonna, note, we're gonna note this by phi. So now I'm gonna build some uh, local operators. So let's say V is a vertex, and then there's an involution on the, on the group weight of fields, which says, okay, well, I have, a, I have a trivialization at this vertex. Let's just switch the, the value of the trivialization between the two covers. So now I, I have a function on the space of fields and I can just pre-compose it with this automorphism. So that is what this operator A sub V is doing, is it's, you know, first switch the trivialization at V and then compute your function. So, oh, so before I say that, I just wanna mention that I said these operators ought to be local. So the Hilbert space was not presented as a tensor product of local Hilbert spaces, but you can write this as, the tensor, as a tensor product of C2 associated to every edge. And so this, this operator is only, you know, is only interesting, meaning not the identity, on, on those Hilbert spaces associate, associated to the edges, which uh, are adjacent to this vertex. So this is, this is, a, this is really a local operator. So another local operator is uh, we'll, we'll define as associated to a face. So what this is, is given a function uh, phi, and give, uh, we're, going to, we're going to modify, let's see, we're gonna modify this by multiplying by the holonomy of a principal bundle around a face. If I highlight, can people see that? Like yes. I currently have some, okay, great. Yeah, yeah. So, 
so we take, okay, we say given, given our function, we produce a new function, bf of phi, and that says given a principal bundle with trivialization, compute, well, take the, um, take the original function and multiply by the holonomy of the principal bundle around the face. And so here it's crucial that we're only on the one skeleton, because if, you're, if your principal bundle extends to the whole manifold, then of course it's holonomy has to be trivial around a face. So this is another local operator. And so the Hamiltonian is a sum of these local operators. So first, this is, this is averaging over the, um, over the action of AV, and this is averaging over the action of BF. So I'm gonna call those H sub V and H sub F. So this is, um, well, I'll say it's a nice Hamiltonian. So the, 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 the um, whole point of this ansatz was, let's study the Torah code by, by studying its low energy uh, field theory, or TFT rather. And so in order to do that, let's see what we can say about the low energy TFT. Even though we can't see everything, we'll be able to see something. So let's, so the, the way to do this is, what are these bases of ground states of the Torah code on various manifolds? So I'm not gonna go into complete detail, but first you check that HV and HF are all commuting projectors. So that is all of HV and HV prime commute, HF and HF prime commute, HV and HF commute, no matter what, for any vertices, VV prime, F and F prime. Moreover, each one is a projector, so it squares to itself. So then linear algebra lemma, this means that the smallest eigenvalue of the Hamiltonian is zero, and that the, uh, the kernel of the Hamiltonian is the intersection of the kernels of these HV and HF operators. So this is, this is the nice situation that you are happy if you are in, and a lot of examples of, of uh, Hamiltonians in, in uh, these, these lattice systems are commuting projectors. So this is, you know, this, this is a good thing. So if you wind through what happened, you know, if we're, so H, HV averaged the action of, of AV, so it says you're fixed under AV. So what that means is that you don't depend on the trivialization, because if you switch the trivialization, nothing happens. So the intersection of the kernels of all HV operators is functions which just don't depend on the trivialization at all. So they're just functions on principles uh, Z2 bundles on the one skeleton. More, so then let's turn to curve HF. So, excuse me, these are the functions which, you know, if you, if you just trace through what, it, what the uh, holonomy condition means, these functions vanish on principal bundles that don't extend across the face F. So in other words, what we're looking at is functions which are zero, except when the principal bundle extends across the entire two skeleton of, of the manifold, if we're looking at all faces F. And so for a principal Z2 bundle, once you've extended across the two skeleton, you extend uniquely across the rest of the, of the manifold. So the upshot is that the space of ground states is the space of functions just on principal Z2 bundles on N. So when I say functions on a groupoid, I mean functions on the set of isomorphism classes of that groupoid. So I'd like to point out something kind of magical that happened, which is important, which is we started with something which manifestly depends on the lattice. You know, if, because we had a trivialization, we needed to know what at least the set of vertices was, or maybe at least how many there were in order to think about the Torah code. But when we pass to the space of ground states, we get a topological invariant that only depends on, on the, the underlying manifold, not its triangulation. So this is the kind of behavior that you should expect from topological phases. And so, um, and whereas, for example, the reasons that, that we don't think fractons are topological, in part is that they don't have this behavior. The space of ground states knows things about the lattice. Anyways, so we see, so we have these, the space of ground states. It's functions on principal Z2 bundles. So you think, is there a topological field theory that I know wh whose state space is functions on principal Z2 bundles? And yes, there is, uh, this is one of the, uh, again, this is an example that people love to study. It's called Z2 finite gauge theory. And you may have heard it called Z2 untwist, untwisted dygraph witten theory. And so it, it assigns to a, a closed n minus one manifold functions on principal Z2 bundles. It assigns to a closed n manifold, so in space time dimension. It's, it just counts the number of principal Z2 bundles and then weighted by uh, the, the size of the automorphism group of, of said principal Z2 bundles. So um, what have we done here? We have not said, aha, we get the entirety of, of this Z2 finite gauge theory out of the, the toric code. What, what we do have, though, is state spaces match, spaces of ground states. 
So you might be thinking, okay, dimensions are the same. You've, you've produced an equality of two numbers, big one. But you can actually go a little bit farther than what we've done here. There is a natural action of the mapping class group on, um, on the state spaces in, in this finite gauge theory. And you can cook up an action of the diffeomorphism group of M on the ground states of this, um, of the toric code. And it turns out that diffeomorphism group action factors through the mapping class group and the two actions coincide. So you have, a, th th this is not just some, like it's a little stronger than just some numbers are the same, though you have to work a little harder. So this is, this is a, you know, this is the sort of the wink, wink, nudge, nudge, not yet a theorem, but definitely a, um, a, a suggestion that we're on the right track. Oh yeah, that's, that's what I, that's what I said. And so if you, if you want to actually see the value, this, this Z2 finite gauge theory on boredism, probably you're out of luck. But if your boredism is the mapping cylinder of a diff, or the mapping torus of a diffeomorphism, then you can use that diffeomorphism action. So we have, we don't have nothing. We have something, but we don't have everything. Are uh, there, before I go on, more questions. Yeah, this is Chris again. Are there yes. any non-trivial, by which I mean non-mapping cylinder boardisms for which it's easy to see the map of Hilbert spaces? Uh, coming from the Torah code? Yeah, for this in this example. Uh, so I haven't thought about that a whole lot. So I, um, here's one possibility, which Dan Fried told me, and which is somewhere in his ref reflection positivity paper with Mike Hopkins, which is let's, so mapping cylinders globally have an O n minus one structure, meaning that you have a global, or sorry, mapping tori, mm -hmm. meaning that you have a, um, you, you know that it's the, um, what's the word? It's really something in dimension n minus one and then um, a cylinder on it. So what, it, but everything here is local. So you should be able to say if you locally have a um, O n minus one structure, or I guess we should say you have an O n minus one structure. So that's, mm -hmm. um, I think that's a non-vanishing vector field or something close to it. So you, you have charts in which you have a direction of time. So what you could, what you in principle should be able to do is take your, you know, cut your manifold up into, into places where you, pieces where you have a direction of time and then use, use that to, so time, uh, to compute. So in the direction of time, you um, exponentiate the, Ham the Hamiltonian and th that tells you time evolution. And so hopefully that should stitch together into a map between the uh, an incoming part and the outgoing part. Um, as for actually doing this in practice, I haven't thought about that much, but um, so something like that may be possible for, for those boardisms. Hmm. I mean, it could be, or, or it could be that precisely time is kind of breaking down in the non-trivial right. boardisms, so. Right, but in these, uh, in these board, boardisms with O n minus one structure, we do have sort of an arrow of time. Of time. So even though these systems are not relativistic, that mm -hmm. seems non-relativistic enough that you might be able to say something. Nice. Yeah. Uh, are there, let's see. Did that, did that address your question? Yeah, yeah. Cool. Uh, more questions before I go on to a different example. All right, cool. Um, so I'm not going to tell you the details about this example because it's a little bit, um, precisely saying it is a little bit finicky. So this, so Friedman and Hastings in 2016 wrote down this model called the GDS model, which is closely related to the Torah code. So the difference is that you, you modify the HV term by a sign. And as I said, defining the sign would take, I think, two slides. And I don't want to, I don't want to digress right now. If you want to know the actual definition, I'd be happy to you know, tell you all about it afterwards. I should remark that GDS stands for generalized double semions because the double semion model in dimension two plus one was the, the sort of the starting case that they generalized. However, the, the GDS model is as far as we know, not a double and it has no semions. So this is a little bit of a weird name. At least it's generalized, I guess. I don't know. So regrettably, the, um, the, the really nice thing that we had for the Torah code, which was that it was a commuting projector Hamiltonian is no longer true. So the proof that we just saw, you know, you have to do something different. That's the bad news. And the good news is it doesn't have to be that different because you can still ring out some commutation relations that are not quite as good. So that allows you to um, actually 
compute the uh, state, the spaces of ground states for the GES model. And so that's that's the main theorem I'm going to tell you about from uh, 2018. Oh, that's that's a while ago now. But let me tell you what, what this theorem is. So first, or sorry. So what what I uh, what I'll do is tell you what the low energy TFT of this GDS model is. And when I mean that, again, as I mentioned, we I can't we don't yet have the ability to say the low energy TFT. We have the ability to see state spaces and representations of the mapping class group. And that's what I. And so what I will what I will tell you in the theorem is a TFT who, which which agrees on those two things. Unfortunately, it's going to, I'm going to say it in terms that haven't been defined yet, but I'll, I'll define them in the next part of the talk. So the um, well, what is this TFT? It is something called a Z2 gauge gravity theory, and the input data is a cohomology class, which is called Lagrangian. I'll say why it's called Lagrangian in a bit. And so what is this cohomology class? It's, it's the degree n part of, a, um, of this expression. So uh, here alpha is, a, um, is the uh, generator of h star of bz2, which you, so you can think of this as a characteristic class of principal z2 bundles. So on any manifold, you know, alpha is no potent, so one plus alpha is invertible. So we, so we can just compute what this class is. And so we're later I will tell you how to, how to produce a TFT with that, um, from that data. So once you have that TFT, then the spaces of ground states and mapping cl class group representations agree with those that you produce from the GDS model on any closed n minus one manifold. So, um, Next, I'll talk a little bit about the invertible case and then um, how to actually define this, this TFTZ. Uh, before I do that, are there any questions about this or anything? All right. So um, this, this is a little bit of a digression, but hopefully a fun one. So one well-known corollary of the cobordism hypothesis is that classifying all topological field theories is very hard. In dimension n, this is, an, this is a problem with category number n. And so, you know, my category number is less than n. So we're going to, uh, so I, I try and think about this in other ways. So one thing you can do is you can say, well, let's focus on an easier subclass that's still interesting. And so that's what invertible field theories are. I think this definition has probably come up at MSRI sometime this semester. I, I, yeah, Ulrika probably mentioned it. Anyways, invertible, invertibility means that you have an inverse in the sense that there, there's some other TFT and that when you tensor them, you get the trivial TFT. So tensor here means pointwise tensor product. So Z tensor Z prime of M is Z of M tensor Z prime of M. And here one, the unit is the, the constant functor into just the complex numbers for every manifold and the identity for every board. So these things up to isomorphism form an abelian group under tensor product. And so that's good. That has category numbers zero. So I'm happy. So just as we said, there are topological phases that should be described by topological field theories. There should be there. We'd like to say there's an analog of invertible topological phases, which are described by invertible field theories. So we'd like to say, okay, uh, tensor the two top these two topological phases together, and if if you can if you can tensor two phases together and get the trivial phase, then those two phases were invertible. So it's the same idea as for invertible topological field theories, but um, Actually making this precise, again, you know, it's, it's a physics thing, but we don't, but just like because of the same issues in defining a topological phase, this isn't yet a mathematical definition. But on uh, lattice models, then we, we, we should be able to say, okay, well, the Hamiltonian, you know, tensor the spaces of states, and then the Hamiltonian is H1 tensor 1 plus 1 tensor H2. So that, that's all, you know, we understand this physics-wise and how to, a little bit how to model it, but the math is not fully there. So first, a little bit of jargon. In physics literature, these are called symmetry protected topological phases or SPT phases. Sometimes you also hear short range entangled. And I'm gonna say IFT just to stand in for invertible topological field theory. So to, to reiterate, there are, there's a notion of invertible topological phase, which is roughly the same idea as invertible topological field theory. And so the, the ansatz should specialize to say that invertible topological phases 
are classified by maybe certain equivalence classes of invertible topological field points. And crucially, this should be easy. So yes. another question. Um, mm -hmm. Is it easy to say a word about why I should, why symmetry protected should make me think invertible? Like what is the f sort of physics situation by which a symmetry protection leads to it being invertible? Sure. So this is a bit of a, um, in my opinion, it's a little bit of a misnomer, but it's one that makes sense. So historically, people looked at, the, the first phases that people looked at were for the symmetry type of oriented with a principal G bundle. So you, you, you might think of this physics-wise as having sort of an, uh, an internal G symmetry acting at every site. Mm -hmm. So what physicists noticed is that there are, if you, if you care about this G symmetry, then these phases are interesting. But if you forget the G symmetry, then you can uh, deform it into a trivial phase. And so you might think of this as saying, well, I have an invertible field theory such that when I have a manifold with a non-trivial principal G bundle, it can be interesting. But if I just specify the, the trivial principal G bundle everywhere, then, it, then it's the trivial theory. So the, it was thought, okay, these phases, originally it was symmetry protected trivial. You have the trivial phase, except it's protected by an interesting symmetry. So it's interesting, except if, you know, so symmetry protected, I guess. And then people realized that these are not really trivial phases. They're actually interesting. And so we got the, um, and so this turned into symmetry protected topological. They're topological phases and they're protected in the sense that they're interesting only in the presence of the symmetry. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it, I remember being very confused when I, by this when I first learned the vocab. Um, I think of these, like, so phys, some people might say that that, that that is a definition and that the invertibility is sort of a consequence, but, um, I think that only works in some cases. Uh, Arun, um, hey, yes. Kevin Walker. Um, <clears throat> I guess I'm still confused. Are, are you saying that, I mean, one can define invertible phases without any reference to a group action. So right. what's the connection you're saying between SPTs and invertible? So the way that I think about it is SPT was the first, there was a notion which, uh, of invertible phase and it was first seen, so the, the right definition in mathematics or physics isn't always the first one that, that people write down. So first, symmetry protected topological, meaning okay, trivial in the absence of symmetry, non-trivial in the presence of symmetry, was a good approximation to the right definition and works in some cases, but in other cases, it's not, it's not right. And invertible, I think, is the correct thing that, that we're trying to get at. Does that, does, I'm not sure if that answers your question though. Um, but then I, you know, so I can imagine classifying SPTs in some dimension and also classifying invertible phases in some dimension. Are you saying I'm going to come to the same answer? Because the, mm. the SPT classification depends on a choice of group, right? Oh, sorry. Yes. Okay. So what's going on here is that topological field theories and, you know, then also invertible field theories, you have to cho choose a symmetry type. And so when people say, okay, well, the symmetry group for um, SBTs, let's say we pick a Z2 internal symmetry and a time reversal symmetry, then there's a dictionary for saying what the symmetry type of the topological field theory is. So in that case, it'd be unoriented with a principal Z2 bundle. And those classifications should match. So the group is also part of the data of when you think about invertible field theories, but it's, it's encoded in the symmetry type. I see. So you're, you're thinking of in invertible theories you know, with some kind of, you know, cyclic group, Z mod K action. You know, uh, yes. Okay, yeah. that, that, thanks. But you, I mean, you could do it much more generally, I guess, but that, yes, that's a good example. Uh, does that address your question? Uh, yes, it does. Cool, uh, more questions. Yeah, I guess I have a related question. This is Colleen Delaney. Okay. Uh, maybe related to Kevin's question. So, the classification of symmetry protected topological phases in some sense is uh, maybe part of this um, a classification of homotopy quantum field theories in the sense of Turayev. So ah, then, yes, yes. Right, so could, could you maybe say a little something about the relationship between your invertible topological field theories and homotopy quantum field theories? Yeah, sure. 
yeah, these, these are all great questions, everyone. Um, but this one, so what Turayev calls a homotopy quantum field theory, the way that I've been thinking about it is, so for a topological field theory, sorry, to think about topological field theory, you should specify a sim, you know, the symmetry type. So for example, maybe the oriented bordism category or the spin bordism category. But let's say you want the bordism category of manifolds together with a map to a space X. So you can write down this bordism category. And so this, kind, this notion of TFT is what Turayev calls a homotopy quantum field theory. So in the cases that people, the, the cases that people consider the most commonly, X is the classifying space of a group. And so you end up with the, the bordism category of manifolds with a principal G bundle. So, um, so the, the idea is, let's say you're doing, if you're doing, S, if you're studying SPT phases with the, um, uh, for an internal symmetry given by G, that, that should correspond to, in topological field theory, the bordism category of oriented manifolds with the principal G bundle. And so we're looking at the invertible field theories there. And so in Turayev's language, we're looking at the invertible homotopy quantum field theories where the target space is BG. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, cool. uh, more questions or anything else that I, ha that I haven't addressed? Okay, um, in that case, I'm gonna go on, but of course, you know, stop me whenever you have a question. So invertible field theories are classified I think this has um, this is I think this has been talked about at various times in this uh, this semester. So I'll go I'll go through it a little bit fast. But just recalling that if you have um, two commutative monoids and a map between them, which is invertible in the sense that its image is contained within the the subgroup of units, then we can extend f to we can make sense of f on the formal inverse of any element of a. So we we group complete a. And we just say f of x inverse is whatever f of x was and then invert it, which we can do because it landed in the invertible objects. So this, this is just you know, play, fun, fun with monoids. And the, the fact is that maps of abelian groups from this group completion to this group of units are the same thing, meaning a natural bijection, with invertible maps between these monoids. So now let's just do that with topological field theories. So instead of commutative monoids, we'll have symmetrical modal categories. And instead of abelian groups, we'll have spectra. And maybe you can say symmetrical modal infinity n categories. And then things, things will still work, although I think some of the, yeah, okay. So at least for, for small, small n at, uh, at up to two, this will definitely work. And afterwards, I think we still have the same theorems, but I'm not sure. So this is taken up by uh, Dan Fried and Mike Hopkins, building on work of Galatius, Madsen, Tillman, Weiss, and Chris Schomerpries. Um, on the um, homotopy type of the bordism category in uh, the one category for, or the topological category for GMTW and the infinity n category for Chris. So what we get is a natural isomorphism between the abelian group of invertible TFTs with a particular ta uh, tangential structure valued in the target symmetric monoidal category of super vector spaces and these maps between spectra. So let me, let me go ahead and say what those are. So MTGN is a certain type of Tom spectrum where we pull back the negative of the tautological bundle. So that's the first thing, and that's what makes this tangential instead of normal. And second, we're looking at ON instead of O infinity. So this is somehow an unstable version. So that's the domain. And the codomain is something called the Pentragon dual of the sphere. So this is closely related. Oh, oops, that, that this should be a, a, a right paren, sorry. But anyways, this is closely related to the brown comets dual of the sphere, just we're using C star instead. So maps into this are the same thing as group, abelian group homomorphisms from pi n of e into, into C star. So that's the codomain. So what is this? This is maps from pi n of this suspension of the madsen tillman spectrum into C star. So if you um, unwind your way through the pentragon tom construction, oops, then this is, a, um, this is a certain kind of bordism group. And I'll just mention that there is, there's also a version for extended TFTs. Uh, though you have to, there's some questions about, okay, well, what is the target if it's not SVECT? Um, before, I, before I go on, questions about this? 
Okay. So, um, so we have we have a Bordism group, and this is a stricter equivalence relation than ordinary Bordism. So therefore, an ordinary Bordism invariant defines one of these kinds of Madsen-Tillman, or sometimes also called Reinhardt or vector field Bordism invariants. And so a C star valued ordinary Bordism invariant gives you an invertible topological field. And in fact, if you specify an, a uh, nice condition called reflection, or if you specify reflection positivity, which is something that you should expect for invertible field theories coming from physics, then you precisely get ordinary Bordism invariants. And the caveat is there's a conjecture on how, how orientation reversal as a Z2 action acts on the Bordism infinity n category. But this is, um, I mean, this conjecture is very believable and it's, you know, almost, pro it's probably true. So that tells you, um, so that tells you that we should be looking at Bordism invariants. So first, let's talk, so let's talk about um, the, um, what invertible field theories, or sorry, this is a classic example of invertible field theories. If you're thinking in SPTs, these are the group cohomology models. So what we're going to do is fix a finite group G and we're going to pick a uh, degree N cohomology class valued in R mod Z. And so this gives you a Bordism invariant of oriented manifolds of the principal G bundle. So the principal G bundle pulls beta back to M, you know, via the classifying map. And now we can evaluate on the fundamental class, you know, because we're in, in degree N and then exponentiate and that lands in C star. So this is, this is a Bordism invariant. So by what, what we saw before, this categorifies to an invertible topological field. And this is called a classical digraph width. So people mentioned the uh, SPTs and th these are, I think, the group cohomology SPTs. So there's that correspondence. The invertible field theory was first constructed by uh, Dan Fried and Frank Quinn in a different looking way. And when I say classical, I mean in the sense of classical field theory. So this looks a lot like the exponentiated action of a uh, classical field theory. So we have a Lagrangian, which is, um, which is beta, and then we integrate it on our manifold. So it's, you know, it's not a, it's, it's a reasonable analogy. And um, in fact, we are going to quantize it later. So this is, this, these are sort of, the, um, these are a commonly studied example. So now let's take a slight variant and let's say that instead of R mod Z, we want Z mod two for the reason. So part of the reason is I'd like to make sense of this on unoriented manifolds. The double, the GDS model does not require an orientation. And so it's low energy TFT also should not require an orientation. So the first step is we pass to Z mod two. And second is you could multiply by, you could take Ah, this n should not be an n. It should be something, it should be an arbitrary degree. Like I might take n minus one and then multiply by w1 of n, the first Stephen Whitney class. I might take n minus three and then multiply with w3 and then maybe do several of these and add them together. So this, so this, this is like a characteristic class that depends on the principal G bundle and on the underlying manifold. And so what we, and so it's again a Bordism invariant this time of unoriented manifolds of the principal G bundle, excuse me. And so these things are going to, going to be called classical gauge gravity theories. So gauge gravity is a term saying that we have uh, the characteristic class so is Lagrangian has terms corresponding to the principal bundle, which are gauge and characteristic class of the underlying manifold. And why are these called gravity is because if they were churn or Pentragon classes, they actually have to do with curvature, but Stiefel Whitney classes, this is just an analogy. Okay, so I'll just, there are plenty of other interesting uh, Bordism invariants and therefore other interesting invertible field theories. So if the ARF invariant of a spin two manifold gives you the ARF theory, which um, was first studied by Sam Gunningham and is, um, is used in like various places in physics. And then of course, if you like pin minus manifolds, there's ARF brown care bear, which Sam and I um, took a look at it a couple years ago and lots more. But the, um, the point is, well, there's two points. So the first is with this robust classification of invertible field theories, we can compare this to pre-existing classifications of SPTs by other methods in physics. So I think uh, a couple of the questions that have already been, already been asked got at this, but the point is we have an abelian group of SPTs 
computed by physicists using very different methods. And we have an abelian group of the corresponding invertible field theories where you, the, the symmetry types match. And these, we'd like these to be the same. So this is taken up by uh, Dan and by Mike Hopkins who compute it in a bunch of different examples and find agreement. And then Jonathan Campbell computes some further examples. So these, the classifications match. And this is, this is a sign that our original onsots, that um, topological phases are well described by topological field theories, is, a, is, is pointing in the right direction. So the invertible case, the easy case, so to speak, is a, is a test case for how valid the general case is. So this, this is something to be happy about, or at least I'm happy about it. I hope you are too. So now um, we can, um, let's see. So now we can also use this as a way of constructing invertible TFTs where you have some reason for um, caring about invertible field theories. And well, it's, this is a pretty easy way to construct them at least if you like, um, you know, if you, if you like boredism, which I do. So the low energy TFT of the GDS model, or at least the, the, the TFT I wrote down, which, which seems to describe it, is not invertible, but we'll be able to start with the class, a classical gauge gravity theory and then do something to it to produce a non-invertible TFT. And so this is a relatively slick construction, which, is, uh, which was convenient for me. And so that's, you know, that's upshot number two that, that I like, an easy way to construct topological field theories. Well, some topological field theories. So how do we do this? So first what you do, or sorry, what you do is you quantize the classical theory. So this is a finite version of path integral quantization. We, uh, we sum over all the gauge fields, which are principal Z2 bundles. Oops. So the good news is M is closed. So this is, this is a finite sum. And therefore we can, the, the path integral as a, as a finite sum is mathematical. And so here, here I'll tell you some of the answers. This, so on closed manifolds, in space-time dimension, what you do is you say, okay, take the classical theory, which requires M and a principal Z2 bundle P, and take the sum of that overall principal Z2 bundles, or overall isomorphism classes, rather, and then you weight by the automorphisms. So the standard way of uh, counting in a groupoid, if you've seen that before. So this really is a sum over principal Z2 bundles. If you're closed in of co-dimension one, it's a little more complicated, where you use the, um, the, what you assign in the classical theory to, um, to produce a vector bundle over the groupoid of uh, Bunzi 2n. So what that is, is for every object in the groupoid, you get a vector space and for every morphism, you get a, um, you get a map between vector spaces. So then we take sections and that gives us the, the state space of this quantized theory. So this is, if, if you're familiar with, with uh, digraph witten theory, this is just, this is, this is exactly what's going on there, although maybe it's said differently than, than, what, than what you've seen, depending on where you read it. And again, these are all finite sums. So these are all, these can be and are defined as mathematical operations on topological field theories. Uh, this is Ezra Getzler. Could I ask a quick yes. question? Of course. Uh, what do you mean by weighted sum? So really what's going on, uh, shoot, if my, if my camera weren't frozen, I, I could write it down. But so there is a, so, this is a finite set, pi zero bunzi 2 m. And so for each time, for e each principal bundle P, we compute whatever the classical theory assigned, which is some number, and then divide by the size of the automorphism group of that principal Z2 bundle. That's the weight, it is the, is the autom size of the automorphism group. Um, the reason I ask is because I didn't realize that that was part of the digraph witten prescription. Uh, is that my mistake? Um, I think it's, I think that is standard is that you have to, um, is that the weights are, are there because otherwise, if I'm remembering correctly, so when, when you want to define this on boardisms, I think the weights are important in, or, in order for it to glue, but I don't remember. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, more questions then, or any follow up question about that. Okay. Um, so just let, let's just recall, this is, this is word for word, the same theorem, but now what's actually happening here is we've quantized the classical gauge gravity theory into this. So let me say, so I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll finish up by saying, how do you actually define this theory Z? 
and then I'll say a little more about um, so, you know, some, some things that we still don't know how to do. So first, the total Stiefel Whitney class times alpha over one plus alpha defines a um, characteristic class. So we, we take the, so as I mentioned, you can take a degree and part of that because one plus alpha is invertible in the cohomology ring of uh, any manifold. So that is a, so this actually, so this is a, um, something that you can write as the Lagrangian of, of a classical gauge gravity theory. We took a cohomology class of principal Z2 bundles, uh, alpha, and multiplied it by Stiefel Whitney classes. So therefore, from this data, beta, we get a um, classical gauge gravity theory. So now we do this, this uh, finite path integral to obtain the gauge gravity theory, and that's what Z is. So in principle, from what I've told you in this, um, in the past couple slides, you, you can unwind that. Oh, well, I didn't say how to get the vector bundle. Okay. But if you, from the, the description of the finite path integral, you can unwind that and use just what I've said to compute this TFT on closed manifolds into co-dimension zero and one. And so um, doing it on bordisms is a little more complicated, but not too, too terrible. So the point is that's so now now you have a description of this TFT and it is telling you it, it, it the state spaces of this TFT are isomorphic to the spaces of ground states of the GDS model and this uh, this intertwines the mapping class group actions that you can find on both. So that's so that that's the main theorem. And I'll, so I'll finish up in the last two minutes by saying what talking about the many, many things that we don't know. So the first most obvious question from this talk, I think, is only state spaces is somehow not, not enough. We'd love to be able to say more and actually see more partition functions. So this is related to, I think, Chris's question from a while ago. And it's not currently clear how to do that. So that's just, that, that is an open question. And um, another different thing is the GDS model is also studied by Lukasz Fudkowski, John Wan Ha, Matt Hastings, and Nat Tantavasadakar in two papers from, from last year. And so they, they have a different argument, a physics argument, with a different conclusion about, um, so what phase is this, is this model in? And so they, they come up with something different than what, than what I did in dimension five, using different methods where they study it solely on flat space. So I think, to reconcile these two methods is going to require knowing, understanding better what is the definition of a topological phase. So somehow this conflict is, a, is an opportunity. It's a good thing because it, it allows us to sort of test these two ansatzes against each other and see, and, and therefore refine them and, and come up with a, a, a closer ansatz to the actual truth. So that's something I'd like to think about at some point. And finally, there's a bunch of variants of topological phases that are not as well understood. So fractons have been mentioned a lot. There's these things called higher order SPTs. And there's this thing called crystalline phases. And in these phases, the symmetry, th these are versions of SPTs or non even non-invertible topological phases in which the symmetry group can act on space. So an example might be uh, phases for a cyclic group where the cyclic group acts on space by rotation. So all of a sudden your topological field theory framework goes out the window because you can't localize these, um, like trying to make things local, which is an important thing for approximating by, by field theory, that, that just doesn't work when you have something non-local non like a rotation. So understanding these will have to go by different methods. Dan and Mike Hopkins wrote down a, excuse me, a proposal using, uh, which is a modified version of their invertible field theory calculation. So it's still expressed in terms of homotopy theory. And so in work in progress, I'm, I'm investigating and comparing that, that proposal in a bunch of examples with um, the, the, the classifications of physicists have produced by other methods. So I think, yeah, okay, I think that's, that's everything. Sorry for going over time. Uh, thank you all for listening.